गुड इवनिंग नमस्कार आप सभी का दसवें सुनील स्मृति व्याख्यान टेंथ सुनील मेमोरियल लेक्चर में हम स्वागत करते हैं वेलकम यू ऑल टेंथ सुनील This campus last ten years, except break during pandemics. Very happy to be here. I would request uh, Anthony take over, and followed by that, uh, after he talks about just a little bit, we are going to have a by Pradeep Vani is a culture of resilience, partly in. प्रतिरोध की संस्कृति का एक सब थोड़ा बहुत हो गया आप सभी का स्वागत Evening, everyone. English guest, Professor Ganesh Devi, chairperson for the evening, Mr. Rasha, Mr. Arun Kumar, Mr. Swamy Adar, English professors, journalists, academics, and uh, researchers, and news, senior students. Uh, on behalf of the Sunil Memorial Trust, I send a very warm welcome to all of you. Especially to our guest of the evening, Mr. Ganesh Devi, who has come all the way from, able to say exactly from where he was in Washington, London, New York, you name it. He was everywhere in the last two weeks alone. And Mr. Devi, thank you so much for agreeing to honor uh, uh, his memory. And to agree to deliver the lecture this evening, I also extend a very warm welcome to all other distinguished uh, attendees here.
The experiment was released in late 1995 after a massive mobilization when the Madhya Pradesh government was forced to grant the fisheries rights in the Tawa Reservoir to a cooperation, cooperative federation of the displaced Adivasi population. The state cabinet also agreed to the demands of granting land rights to the displaced families who had settled wherever they could and made important advances in terms of recognizing the Adivasi's right to community forest. In its 10 years of existence, the TMS was widely hailed and seen as a model for the cooperative sector where state intervention was minimal and the benefits were successfully transferred to the poorest people even as production soared. Sunil also continuously wrote on socio-political issues, mainly in the Hindi newspapers and magazines, especially using his training in economics to comment on the process of privatization, liberalization, and globalization that gradually eroded India's public sector and adversely affected its farmers and the small and rural industries. Taking forward the Indian socialist thought Sunil considered environment an important element of a sustainable and egalitarian society and wrote on the possibilities of a 21st century democratic socialism. Around 2010, he became the editor of the socialist Hindi magazine Samaik Vartha, established by Krishan Patnaik in early 1980s and produced a series of notable issues discussing both national and international topics including a special one on the Latin American socialist experiments. Sunilji left us on 21st April 2014. Indriji felt was driven more by the interest of the big corporates, ignoring the core and critical interest of the common people. I would now invite uh, Puditwani. First video? Yeah. Okay. Now we will have a, a brief video highlighting Sunilji's life and work. Uh, that will be followed by uh, singing by the well known art and cultural group, uh, Professor uh, yes, Pratidwani, uh, Professor Subhendu Ghosh, Prashant, and Dola here. Those who are associated with JNU does not need much of an introduction about Pratidwani. And uh, Balu has already done it. So, first, the video to be followed by Pratidwani. Thank you.
ये जानतियों के जानवर रखे और स्टॉल फीडिंग करे ये सब बातें इसमें तो हम लोगों ने सोचा कि नहीं ये खतरनाक चीज है जंगल और आदिवासी को अलग करने की एक साजिश है और इसलिए मध्य प्रदेश के जितने जन संगठन थे उन्होंने इसका पुरजोर विरोध किया विश्व बैंक की योजना का और जगह जगह इसके खिलाफ काफी आंदोलन हुए अंततः विश्व बैंक को इस योजना को बीच में ही रोकना पड़ा तो हमारे देश का नक्शा उठा लें आप और उसमें ये देख लें कि देश में जंगल कहाँ है और आदिवासी कहाँ है जंगल वही बचा है जहाँ आदिवासी रहते हैं जहाँ दूसरे लोग रहते हैं वहां तो जंगल खत्म हो गया है तो कहा इसमें एक चीज ये निकली कि तवा जलाशय की मछली पर विस्थापितों का ही अधिकार होगा किसी ठेकेदार को देने के बजाय नीलाम करने के बजाय विस्थापितों का ही अधिकार होगा वही मछली पकड़ेंगे वही बेचेंगे वही उसकी रफ्वाली करेंगे वही उसका विकास का कार्य करेंगे और इसके तहत लगभग तैतीस चौतीस प्राथमिक सहकारी समितियां बनी मछुआरों की जो विस्थापित आदिवासियों के गाँव थे उनमें और उनका एक सहकारी संघ बना अब ये जो तवा मत्स्य संघ का काम इसको संक्षेप में हम तवा मत्स्य संघ कहते हैं तवा मत्स्य संघ का काम है वो अपने आप में एक मिसाल बना इसके पहले जो ठेकेदार का काम था और जो आ, सरकारी जो निगम था मत्स्य विकास निगम उसका काम था उसके मुकाबले आदिवासी मछुआरों की इस सहकारी संघ ने हर दृष्टि से कई गुना बेहतर काम किया मछली उत्पादन दुगने से ज्यादा हो गया मछुआरों की संख्या काफी बढ़ गई रोजगार बढ़ गया और मछुआरों की आमदनी तो जाहिर है जो बिचौलिए खत्म हो गए तो वो भी काफी बड़ी और इतना ही नहीं मछली संरक्षण के उपाय जो होते हैं जो उसके नियम होते हैं उस पर पहली बार ईमानदारी से क्योंकि आज बात भाषा और उसकी विभिन्नताओं को लेकर के हो रही है उसमें जिस तरह के फ़र्क हैं उसको लेकर हो रही है इसलिए शायद ये बताने की ज़रूरत है कि प्रतिध्वनि जे में बनी हुई एक संस्था एक ग्रुप है जो लगभग 40 साल पहले बना था और आप देख सकते हैं कि उस यात्रा की शुरुआत तो 40 साल पहले हुई लेकिन वो यात्रा आज तक जारी है जो लोग खड़े हैं उनके 
उनकी उम्र को देखकर के आप अंदाज़ा लगा सकते हैं कुछ लोगों की दाढ़ी बिल्कुल सफ़ेद हो गई है कुछ लोगों की दाढ़ी अभी निकलनी शुरू हो गई है आ, लेकिन आ, ऐसा हुआ कि कुछ छात्रों ने मिल करके ये निश्चित किया कि वो देश के अलग अलग इलाकों के गीतों को इकट्ठा करेंगे जिस तरह से सुनील एक राजनीतिक प्रक्रिया को शुरू कर रहे थे वैसे ही कोशिश थी कि क्या संगीत के माध्यम से भी उन प्रक्रियाओं को समझा जा सकता है जेल में रहने का ये फायदा था कि देश के अलग अलग इलाकों के लोग थे यहाँ पर तो उन गीतों को इकट्ठा करना आसान था फिर प्रतिध्वनि के साथ ही देश के अलग अलग इलाकों में गए और वहाँ से उन्होंने गीतों को इकट्ठा किया और प्रतिध्वनि के साथ ही लगभग सोलह भाषाओं में गाना गा सकते थे हैं आप और जब वो गाने इकट्ठा कर रहे थे तो जो बात उन्हें समझ में आई वो ये थी कि ये गीत जो हैं कहीं ना कहीं लोगों के संघर्षों लोगों के सपनों सबको आगे बढ़ाते हैं सो so, आप एक और बात नज़र आ रही थी वो था कि जो डेवलपमेंट का जो डोमिनेंट नैरेटिव है लगातार हम लोग विकास की बात करते रहते हैं और उसको मान लेते हैं कि इससे सबका विकास हो रहा है लेकिन उनके गीतों में कहीं ना कहीं हमें इस पूरे विकास की प्रक्रिया के ऊपर में सवाल उठते हुए नज़र आते हैं उन सवालों को हमने ठीक से नहीं देखा था नहीं परखा था लेकिन आज के दिन में हमें वे सवाल ज़्यादा सफाई से नज़र आ रहे हैं तो वैसे ही गीतों की श्रृंखला में हम लोग एक गीत पहला जो गीत गीत प्रस्तुत करेंगे वो पूरी तरह से जे का गीत है क्योंकि उसे हमारे साथी गोरख पांडे ने जो कि जे के एक छात्र थे और जिन्होंने हिंदी और भोजपुरी में बहुत सारे गीत लिखे उन्होंने जे के किसी हॉस्टल में लिखा था संभवतः गंगा हॉस्टल में लिखा था जो कि उस समय लड़कियों का हॉस्टल नहीं था और उन उस गीत को स्वर में दी जो रूप दिया गया वो प्रतिध्वनि के साथियों ने दिया और शायद वो कुछ यहाँ इसी जगह पर था यहाँ पर ये इमारत नहीं होती थी छोटी मोटी पहाड़ियाँ होती थी उन्हीं के बीच में बैठ करके कुछ साथियों ने उसको स्वर दिया तो, तो इस तरह से उस गीत को गाने में हम लोग जे की उस परंपरा को भी कहीं ना कहीं दोबारा याद कर रहे हैं आ, उसके शब्द हैं गुलामियाँ अब हम ना ही बजे पो अजदिया हमरा के भावे ले हम गुलामी अब नहीं करेंगे हमें आज़ादी अच्छी लगती है शुक्रिया बसन अवस्थो हेलो हाँ आवाज़ आ रही है आ, मैं देख पा रहा हूँ कि बहुत लोग हॉल के बाहर हैं तो मुझे अच्छा नहीं लग रहा है क्या ऐसा मुमकिन है कि जो लोग बाहर हैं उनको अंदर लाया जाए थोड़ा आगे के सक के बैठ जाएंगे तो पीछे वाले जो लोग अंदर हैं वो थोड़ा एकोमोडेट करें कहीं पे भी बैठ जाइए खड़े हो जाइए लेकिन अंदर आइए क्योंकि एक अदाकार के लिए वो अच्छा नहीं लगता है कि उनके जाने वाले उनके हेलो ऑस्ट्रेटिंग मोनिक ठीक है हेलो हाँ ठीक है सीढ़ी में बैठ जाइए साइड में और जगह है वहां बैठ जाइए या खड़े हो जाइए कहीं कहीं से भी लेकिन कोई यस प्लीज नमस्कार गुड इवनिंग आई एम द स्पीकर ऑफ द इवनिंग मैं आप सबको विनती करता हूं जो बाहर खड़े वो स्टेज पे आके बैठे आई एम फील वेरी हैप्पी स्टेज पे जगह है स्टेज पे आके बैठे ये बहुत अच्छा होगा प्लीज टेक द स्टेज आप जो भी खड़े हैं अगर आपको 
कोई अरे ना हो तो आप यहाँ ऊपर आके बैठे कहीं भी कहीं भी बैठ तो इजाजत है हम शुरू करें आप अंदर आते रहिए लेकिन हम लोग शुरू कर रहे हैं गुलमिया अब हम नाई बजाई बो गुलमिया अब हम नाई बजाई बो गुलमिया अब हम नाई बजाई बो अजल दिया हमरा के बाबे जे अजल दिया हमरा के बाबे जे गुलमिया अब हम नाई बजाई बो गुलमिया अब Yeah.
बिरसा मुंडा की याद में गाना है सिंगारी भाषा में लिखा हुआ है और आपकी तालियों से मुझे पता चल रहा है कि आप सब लोगों को उनके बारे में कुछ बताने की जरूरत नहीं है लेकिन कहीं ना कहीं जो आधुनिक सभ्यता है उसकी सबसे बड़ी लड़ाई शायद जंगल वालों से ही रही है सबसे ज्यादा परेशानियां उन्हें ही झेलनी पड़ती हैं और इसीलिए सुनील भी जब बात करते थे जल जंगल जमीन की बात करते थे और बिरसा मुंडा का जो विद्रोह था वो भी कहीं ना कहीं सिर्फ अंग्रेजों के खिलाफ ही नहीं था हिंदुस्तान के उन लोगों के खिलाफ भी था जिन्होंने उनकी जमीन पर उनके जल पर कब्जा किया था उनकी याद में आज भी जो गीत गाए जाते हैं उनमें से एक गीत प्रस्तुत है आपके सामने धतुरे जंगल तुम्हारी बोलने
very uh, uh, ambitious project that he took. But his first work, if I'm not wrong, after Amnesia, celebrated work, uh, actually opened uh, intellectual um, sort of floodgate of thinking about the idea of literary criticism and how thinking about literary criticism through Indian languages needs to be thought through much more carefully rather than taking Western European tradition of looking at the literary criticism. I think after, if one has read after Amnesia, one is not really surprised to see where Professor Devi has taken us in his intellectual journey. Um, he has actually in some way inaugurated a new era in the literary historiography after the Amnesia book and many other works that he has produced since then. His work on many heroes actually on Indian literary criticism and Indian literature is another uh, very, very interesting work to read. Um, after having studied at Shivaji University at Kolhapur, where he did his PhD on the poetry of Sri Arbindo Ghosh, and later on got Rotary Foundation Fellowship, which allowed him, and this is something which I found out recently, to choose a university of his own choice anywhere in the world to do uh, further studies. And he chose University of Leeds for his second master's thesis, where he wrote his thesis on none other than A.K. Ramanujan, another this is a very, very prominent literary writer of our country. He taught at the Department of English at uh, MSU Baroda for only 15 years and he was telling us at T that he left at the age of 45 because he had better things to do than just stay within the confines of a university. And he then won many, uh, during this period, he also won many fellowships to go to Yale University and was a Jawaharlal Nehru Fellow. For his work on languages and particularly to tribal languages, tribal communities, he won prestigious awards. Awards like Sahitya Academy in 1993, Padma Shri Award in 2014, Sark Writers Award in 2001, Prince Claus Award and Lingua Pax Award, which is one of the highest awards for work in languages and literatures in 2011 for the kind of work he has done in the domain of linguistic diversity and preservation. More than winning the awards and lecturing all over the world, I think what is remarkable and truly um, astounding about Professor Devi is that he has been an institution builder. He has set up institutions on his own without much of his state funding, I would say. Institutions such as Bhasha Research Center at Baroda in 1996 to study the denotified and nomadic tribes and groups and their languages. Later on with Mahashweta Devi and Lakshman Gaikwad, he founded the DNT, that is Denotified and Nomadic Tribes Action Group in June 1998. The following year in 1999, he founded the much talked about and much known now, the Adivasi Academy at Tejgar, and this was one of the reasons he quit his job at MSU Baroda to study further the tribal communities or the children of these tribal communities to learn in their own languages. I think the another uh, work that Professor David did, which I don't think anybody else can dare to do, is the People Sign Linguistic Survey of India, which he started in 2011. People's Linguistic Survey of India was done exactly after 100 years, after Grierson's Linguistic Survey of India, the colonial uh, uh, attempt to count and classify the languages. And Mr. Professor Devi is also a very persuasive person and not just simply intellect, armchair intellectual, because he knows about the each and every corner of this country. So there were 3,000 volunteers who joined him in doing this new linguistic survey of India, independent India, without any state funding. 
And I remember, because he also roped me in, in this project, he dedicated the 50 volumes which came out of this PSLI to the nation on the day uh, when the work was completed at Gandhi Peace Foundation with a very emotive uh, atmosphere that he created there. Um, and the PSLI tells us, apart from the census enumeration of languages which is different over the years, that there are 780 Indian languages still working, but there could have been 100 more languages, but unfortunately 220 languages seem to have died. Uh, these volumes have been published uh, in, they are multilingual volumes, they are not just published in English by Orient Blacksmen. He also remarkably brave in many of his, uh, I think, activities, both as intellectual as a conscientious person. He returned his Sahitya Academy Award as a mark of protest. against the assault on intellectual freedom and murder of intellectuals like Kalburgi, Pansare, Taupkagar and Gauri Lankesh. I think that takes a courage to return the award which he truly deserved. He did not only this, he, he returned to Dharwar in 2016, meaning to say he left his home in Baroda and decided to settle in Dharwar at that age. And he started a Dakshayan movement, which I think is one of its kind. A Dakshayan movement described very loosely as a southward movement of artists and intellectuals, which now has spread to many other states like West Bengal, Telangana, Gujarat, UP, Goa, and Delhi. It aims to collect the linguistic discourses and purities of various kinds and defies the dictum, which seems to be the norm these days in political uh, speeches, one language and one nation. In 2015, he was also actively involved with the Global Language Status Report. He has also, as I said, he is not simply an armchair intellectual and academic, which he actually, uh, 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 in some ways, he actually uh, brings in his scholarly activism uh, to the front and therefore has put the script of 11 languages, which is no small a job, which were predominantly oral earlier. He has put more than 20,000 tribal children in the non-formal school educational system and has promoted and published literature in 26 languages, campaigned for the protection of the rights of the tribal communities in many, many places of the country. So, how does one talk about his writings, which are enormous, as I said, more than 190 volumes, of course, it's not fair on my part even to summarize the main argument, but what I did, uh, since I have been a great follower of his writings, I thought I would share some of my ideas that I understood and I took from his writings, which actually in some way synchronize with Sunil's ideological uh, commitment of Jal Jangal Jameen, we can add Jal Jangal Jameen Juwan, all four. Um, so one of the things I think uh, Professor Devi has been arguing for a very long time that homo sapiens are lingual. That means they need language or they are born with language. And that defines the distinction between human beings and animal world. And he carries this forward through many of his writings in many different ways. Um, he's also very emphatic about the fact that knowledge gets transferred through languages because languages bring the sensory perception of the phenomenal world surrounding us. And this can be done generationally and that can also affect the memory formation of individuals and societies. Similarly, in his writings, he continues to emphasize that experiences are made sense of through gestures, senses, languages, and memories. They're codified, 
they create the possibilities of remembering through classificatory logic different taxonomies of grammar and logic. I would also like to add here that Professor Devi is not a traditional linguist, one who only looks at grammar as if it is frozen in time and space. Actually, his understanding about language is something like a living life of people um, that he has been interacting and, and living with. So he does talk about language in, in, in a very, very different way than from many others uh, that you will know. Language therefore distinguishes humans in his understanding from animal species. It provides a bridge between past and future and he, he has said it in many places that the present is important to understand the past. He considers language to be extremely important in the evolutionary scheme of human beings over centuries or to understand the idea of or the discovery of being. He is also someone who is extremely uh, concerned about the way in which narratives are produced or promoted or the idea of history is promoted and, and produced and I think there can't be a better time than this to hear the critique from him about the way in which historical narratives are produced to for certain specific political purposes. Through language, he con continues to say, we express creativity and champion the cause of the preservation of cultures. And I was really stuck in one of the writings he says that during tsunami, the, the, the Andamanese, uh, uh, the, the original inhabitants of Andamanese, the Andamanese community, uh, who did not suffer much of a devastation because they had the ecosystem that they made sense of through their own linguistic and cultural science systems. So language is not simply an instrument of communication, simply a strategy of communication, but it is also part of the cultural ecosystem, the cultural habitus, the cultural world that we all breathe and live in. Language's speech is something I think Professor Devi continues to emphasize and therefore he departs from these very traditional Chomskyan understanding of language as just reduced to grammar or imminent grammar. It is in utterances, in its daily evocation, it's in gestures, in its symbols, in its signs that each one of us is constituting the language and he has extensively worked on this framework which actually is something that we in JNU would be very uh, familiar with because over here we read Bakhtin and Oloshino and Marx and so and so forth, all of whom talk about language as a dialogical imagination. So language is a speech, writing comes much later to record memory and from transactional purposes, which he emphasizes is carried on by homo sapiens. Language is also a source of security for defense, for migration, for communication. In other words, language is symbolic, it is emotive, it is cultural, but at the same time, the same language is also used to create and perpetrate forms of violence. Um, so, it, another aspect of language which I think is central to his understanding and which uh, will strike a chord with us is the idea of intersubjectivity, which I think not many linguists talk about because they look at language as a structure more than as a practice. The idea of human com communication creating habitus, structures of feeling, the same way as Raymond William talks about it, or creating the idea of um, conducting ourselves. I mean, he has a beautiful take on how the genes give us a habit of conducting ourselves and not simply genes in the manner in which we understand. So, uh, without further to say more, though I could go on, I would only like to say that Professor Devi is someone who symbolizes that life must be lived without fear. Without fear and under no conditions of or constraints of any kind, living under freedom is a cherished dream for all civilizations and that's where Professor Davies' work on languages, cultures and civilizations is 
absolutely remarkable for our times. There is, therefore, we must move away from this whole idea of one nation, one language, one culture, one tax, one citizenship, one election, and so and so forth. Professor Devi's work actually strongly uh, reminds us that the idea of civilization is in plurality and diversity and not in oneness. So true in legacy and memory of Sunil, there could not be a better person than Professor Devi today to mark the 10th memorial lecture. And I would only end by saying that it is in his labyrinth of imagination, the, an academic imagination and activism, which is a true solace in these terrible times when Gaza is burning, humanity is being murdered, and both Palestine and Ukraine need answers from us. So we are extremely grateful and privileged to have Professor Devi with us on this Jal, Jameen, Jangal, and Zuban. May I invite you now, Professor Devi? Ladies and gentlemen, all eminent professors, student friends, and of course the chairperson, Professor Asha Sarangi, you've been very kind in asking me to be here. Mera ji chata hai. कि क्योंकि वो आपको मांग ऐसी करके मेरे तरफ देखना पड़ता है कि वहीं से मैं बात करूं लेकिन वो सभ्यता से इफ यू से आई विल गो एंड स्पीक फ्रॉम जिसको आई इफ यू फाइंड इट ए पेन इन द नेक आई गो देयर ये या आना ही था और किसी का सजेशनों को मैं बोलू ही ना मुझे यहाँ आना ही था क्योंकि सुनील जी का जीवन बहुत इंस्पायरिंग रहा है और उससे भी ज़्यादा इंस्पायरिंग उनकी जो उनके जो विचार थे वो रहे एक अलग प्रकार के समाज के लिए अलग प्रकार के वास्तव के लिए अलग प्रकार का अलग प्रकार की राजनीति हो तो उस वो करने का तरीका भी अलग होना चाहिए ये सोच मुझे बड़ी पसंद आती है और इस सोच को लेके ही मैं आपके सामने कुछ बातें रखना चाहता हूँ मेरे लिए ये बड़ा सम्मान है कि आपने सोचा मुझे बुलाए मैं आपका बहुत आभारी हूँ धन्यवाद देना चाहता हूँ फ्रेंड्स आई एम नॉट हियर टू परसुएड यू टू माय पॉइंट ऑफ व्यू आई एम नॉट गोइंग टू प्रेजेंट टू यू एनी अर्थ शैटरिंग न्यू पॉइंट ऑफ व्यू एक्सपेक्टिंग यू टू एग्री विद इट I am here in the hope that while speaking to an assembly like this, probably the most intelligent of the country's youth, if I present a serious issue in a serious way, and hope that in future. you might take some strands from these and investigate them 
and come out with proper results. I would then feel happy, grateful, as an old man standing at the, at the threshold of Vismruti. The title I chose is Linguistic Diversity and the Making of India. I was asking myself, what is this making of India? This is not make in India, by the way. <laughs> that is only value addition, it's not innovation. <clears throat> uh, making of India, how is India made? Who made it? I have rhetorically many times heard that Hindustan, Bharat, India, which you call the name of India, वो क्या है वो नदियाँ है या पर्वत है all the rhetoric I heard with great admiration for rhetoric but I thought I would think more coolly as to when India was made and where it was made I am not getting into the question of who made it and to my mind the answer is India got made several times over I just want to run through that and while I do that, I would like to add some information about what language was doing at that time. Every time India was being made, what was language doing, what languages were doing to that. Because it is a broad brush portrayal of our past. Please do not expect me to provide every minute detail. There is another space and another time and another forum for doing that. So here is my broad brush picture of how India was made. And I said India was made several times over. Not at the same place, at different locations. I will go back to the... Uh, without without taking up the question of origin I'll go back to the earliest known memory of our people, Indians and that earliest known memory comes from genetics which tells us that there were migrations of Homo sapiens out of Africa Homo sapiens, as Professor Asha Sarangi mentioned, have had about 70,000 years of articulate life. That is why Homo sapiens were in the making for several, a couple of million years, and at least for five lakh years, uh, with very specific skills of weapon making, like stone tools and so on, at least handling things, holding the hold of the using fingers. For the last 70,000 years, Homo sapiens have spoken and not spoken like birds and fish, not simple tones, complex sentences. That is what we call language. I should add here that by language, I understand there are many, many phenomenological questions related to my consciousness in my mind and I just don't know what Immanuel Kant would have called the phenomenal world whether it exists out there or it is a dream that whether it's Maya, Yabala or what I don't know but one thing I am sure and that is there is a bridge connecting the consciousness and the phenomenal world and that bridge is language and without language, had there been no language, we would not have been able to spot the stars in the sky. We would not have been able to name them and therefore know them. Because we do not know what we do not name. In order to know something, you have to name it. And therefore, language is the bridge between the human consciousness and the phenomenal world. So I am speaking of that language. 70,000 years of the lingual life of the Homo sapiens, the consciousness of those early ancestors of ours,
workers was engaging with the outside world by using language and they arrived here they 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 migrated they migrated because they could weaponize language language became language became their guard their weapon uh, in order to move forward move, move ahead in their migration are uh, defending themselves they arrived here first 65000 years before our time then another 45000 years before our time some of them went to south india what we call south india they would not have called it south or north at that time they were, might be having different words for directions uh they they migrated in several waves but not not these waves were not daily waves these were spaced in time with large gaps in between and when they came here if they found food which was they were, as hunter gatherers they had to find animals and if they found enough animals they settled at places and some moved ahead and those who settled if there are spoons of anthropology here you would know that there is a technical term in anthropology called the population knot k n o t if there is a group size of about 8 to 900 persons they stay at one place they tend to stay on they do not find it necessary to migrate unless there is a shortage of food or shortage of energy or water some natural resource population knots were formed where they settled and since they moved into this area it was not known as india or south asia perhaps i don't know what name they would have used i don't know if they had an idea of the map of this whole subcontinent perhaps not perhaps yes i don't know we don't know it as well but these different groups develop their own language when they splintered in different groups one group used one form of the language that was inherited another group that moved on added to it terms related to nature this stage of development of languages continued in this i am using the term country in a popular way and not in a technical way this this of uh, this uh, kind of state of affairs continued in this country in our part of the world until agriculture came here from iran that's about 7000 years before our time roughly 5000 years before christ by then hundreds of languages had taken root and evolved and had absorbed terms related to ecology terms related to animal life and birds and if it had not happened it would be surprising we cannot deny the fact that such languages developed here when agriculture came while the technology of agriculture came from iran towards the east the nomenclature related to those processes happened to be native nomenclatures i mean take a simple test when persian and english language are widespread here and we accepted so many words look at the terms that are used for farming and agriculture in any part of the country and you will find that they are neither from persian nor from sanskrit nor from english they are pre sanskrit pre persian pre english many languages in india has been the backdrop for subsequent developments in this country till about Two th- 
4,000 years before Christ, that's 4,000 years before our time, this was the linguistic situation of the country. And if I had some way of going back to that time, I would simply find there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of languages being spoken by people. About 1500 years before Christ, that's 500 years after the decline of the Indus civilization, a new language entered this part of the world. And that is, uh, that is a branch of the Indo-European languages uh, developing into Indo-Iranian, Indo-Aryan and later, which we later called the Sanskrit language. Sanskrit was a refined form of that language, but when it was coming, it was moving from Eurasian steppes, uh, there is the question, did it come from here, there to here, or did it go from here to there? The answer is not given by me, the answer is given by horses. Horses were not native to this country, and horses allowed the Eurasians to, to pull their carts at a speed which was unprecedented, allowing those horse carts to be used as weapon launching, arrow launching platform, giving them a definite superiority, uh, arm superiority, and that helped them in expanding from the, from the Eurasian civilizations, small towns, big towns, the uh, Sintashta, Mitanni and so on. Uh, but I will not get into that history. All that I want to say that when Sanskrit came, and I'm, I am extremely fond of the Sanskrit language. It's a great language. It's one of the greatest languages that the world has ever produced. I'm not saying the greatest. There are many great languages. There is, for instance, in Maharashtra, in Buldana district, a, uh, a language being spoken in three talukas. And that's a great language because it has been in existence for the last 35,000 years. Nehali is the name. All the linguists in the world are looking at that language today. They have not been able to decide the precise ancestry of that language. They have not been able to place it in any language families. So that's a great language in my opinion. Sanskrit is as great as the Nihali language is. Why not accept it? When Sanskrit came here, it brought about a change in India and India was made again. Through the earlier phase that I discussed in the civilization, India had developed population knots, which means in other words, it had developed the idea of a village. The village India was made at that time. Of course, the city India collapsed, the Indus civilization collapsed. But uh, that's a different story. With the arrival of the Sanskrit, we, created, we started creating India differently by bringing in a new expression of language, which we can call literature. Prior to the Sanskrit uh, expression, we do not have any known source of literature in this country. And we have to accept it. The Vedic, if Vedas can be called literature, it is the first instance of literature we have. But more important than that, that new arrangement of India brought in the idea of abstraction which allowed humans to imagine gods, humans to imagine an existence which is beyond the human existence. It also allowed humans to create what we now call philosophy. When I speak of that particular moment in time, 1500 years before Christ, I am not just staying there, I am going down in history, uh, coming uh, way beyond the Christian, I mean, uh, the years of Christ. It is in those 1500 years prior to Christ that we had Buddhism, we had the Jaina philosophy, 
uh, we had the epics and so on. And uh, uh, we have to appreciate the fact that Buddha, who did not use the Sanskrit language and preach in other languages, was dealing with extremely sophisticated philosophical categories indicating that the languages in which he was transacting had their existence at least for 500 or 1000 years prior to the time Buddha started using those languages. Because an altogether new language cannot have the, does not have the capacity to bear complex philosophy. I am thinking of Jain, I mean the Jain thought. This is the Aparigra, concept of Aparigra or Kalanu. For the Kalanu is the atom of time. Aparigra is not holding with your, you know, not grabbing things. That is the idea of property has to be there. The idea of, idea of uh, profit has to be there. I don't know if the idea of interest was there, but greed uh, was there. And, and that means uh, supplies and uh, demands, attention had to be there in order for the Jain thinkers to come up with such a concept which they were doing not in the Sanskrit language but in some other languages, Prakrut or Pali. This new ordering of India put India in the framework of literature, thinking about gods, thinking about the state in a different way and therefore social legislation some of it is terrible, some of it is not so terrible, some of it can be even, I mean, it can be, you can call it progressive for those times. I am not getting into the merit of what the legislation was, I am not getting into the merit of what Manusmuti was. But the fact that these Smutis could come up indicates that India was being shaped differently. The location. Previously, this population knots had gone all the way to the south and partly to the eastern, uh, eastern uh, areas of the subcontinent. But this new shaping was happening primarily in the north, on the western side. And when it happened on the eastern side, some of it had to perforce migrate to the western side. The location had changed. I now move further in this. India was made once again. You know what, what kind of India it was recently uh, investigated. But certainly the role, uh, our exposure to Arabic has played a role. Turkish language that has played a role. No doubt about it. But there must be something in it within us which required this change. Perhaps we were trying to reset our equation with gods. And that's why all the saints tried to humanize God, whether they were Sufis or they were, or they were uh, Kabir Panthis or they were followers of Namdev or Tukaram or, or uh, Basveshwar. Humanize God. Bring the world back to the human sphere was the, was the most intense uh, craving, desire of that India. By the way, that India rejected the idea of literature as the previous India had accepted. The idea of, of literature that the Sanskrit Pali Prakrut of a thousand years, first millennium had accepted, got rejected. Paper came in the picture. All of you know and if you don't, you should know that Delhi was extremely prosperous in the 13th century because of the paper merchants of Delhi. Most lucrative business in those days. Paper came and with the paper came democratization of language. And a greater variety of diversity of language. Of the previous time, if I, if I look at the diversity of language, I find sometimes mention of eight or ten or fifteen languages. In the Mahabharata, there is, uh, the, you know, at the Adiparva, there is 
श्लोक इसे अष्टादश शता अष्टादश सहस्त्राणी अष्टादश शता चेती शुको वेती संजय वेती आय डोंट नो संजय नो समथिंग शुक नो समथिंग डिफरेंट पीपल ऑफ डिफरेंट कास्ट थ्री डिफरेंट कास्ट का वर्णस कॉन्ट्रीब्यूटेड टू द महाभारत बट इट स्पीक्स ऑफ थ्री वेन आई गो टू पानिनीज ग्रामर पानिनी इज टॉकिंग ऑफ वेरियस वेज ऑफ स्पीच बट नॉट 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 ओवर ए सिंगल डिजिट न्यूमर when i come to the riti siddhant of the let's say the or the or the kavya mimamsa of 6th or 7th century uh, i don't get names of more than 10 or 15 except in one one rare uh, manuscript uh, which is uh, which is about music brahad deshi there is naming of musical styles in different languages of india and the number is larger with the bhakti a era in the last 1000 years i would say first half of the last 1000 years the number of languages mentioned increases whether it is albaruni or ibn batuta or you name whichever traveler they naming our languages and you find many more names mentioned in those sources paper democratized language and democratization of language also help in democratization of divinity earlier god was remote but my tukaram in marathi could fight with his god he could abuse his god abuse in out of affection as ramkrishna parmahansa of last century would do it in bengal get angry with god uh, god became sakha that's yar became uh, uh, beloved uh, god became uh, at times servant uh, god became i mean many forms so divinity was brought closer paper helped us in bringing god closer to us and languages new languages started emerging uh, if i look at the history of gujarati language or bangla language or odia language or most of the indo aryan languages after the 11th century they start emerging as indian languages modern indian languages in the south the story is slightly different tamil existed previously uh, but from tamil uh, kannada had uh, uh, emerged a little earlier than 11th century uh, but uh, malayalam and telugu uh, emerged during those times new languages people got new languages people started bringing in the diversity to lose the control of systems that were set previously a new india got made once again and the location this time was spread all over it was there in assam in shankar dev it was there in the south it was there in basaveshwar in karnataka it was there in tyagaraj in gujarat it was everywhere india emerged from everywhere in every tongue earlier in the previous era of the literature that i am calling it was the varna now it was the caste the voices started emerging from and once again uh, we had a new way of relating to language we built our bridges with the phenomenal world anew once again printing came in and what existed prior to that as literature suddenly got trashed as oral and printed alone became the real literary expression i i should have added that this similar thing had happened in the previous time also that is during the era of literature it was literary creativity philosophical creativity theological creativity religious creativity but in century onward indians brought in a new manifestation of language called translation
there doesn't appear to be any translation in existence prior to the 11th century in our country. But there, there was rewriting of a manuscript, but no translation. 11th century onward, translation was brought in as a linguistic expression. Similarly, uh, Nandeva's uh, commentary on the Gita was translation of the Gita and then commentary. I mean, so many translations appeared. Mahabharata, Ramayana, Tulsi Ramayana is one of those. With, with uh, the coming of the printing, all of that became relegated to the domain of the oral and therefore non literature. The colonial phase made India differently. Languages acquired a new life, particularly in the 19th century. Great literary efflorescence could be seen in Bangla, in Marathi, in Kannada, Tamil, Hindi, every language, major language. And people started producing printed literature for constructing the society differently. And it came up from everywhere once again. The nation was expanding. India was expanding over, this, over these eras. India was expanding. That with our independence, we struck a new relationship with language diversity. And in the constitution, we were given the eight schedule. Uh, Professor Sarangi has done a lot of work on that particular uh, field. So I will be brief. But our nation accepted that India, if India becomes a nation, and when it becomes a nation, shall necessarily be a multilingual nation. And so the debates beginning with 1926 till 1949, all accepted that India, to be India, has to be a multilingual nation. This was a bold step, considering that we had accepted the spirit of nationalism from Europe. And in Europe, there were at least two instances of rather militant monolingual nationalism. One was Italy, the unification of Italy, and the second was Germany, in the unification of Germany. A single language, dominant. it is only these two countries that turned up to promote fascism in the 20th century. India and therefore decided that it will be a multilingual country. <coughs> it was a new India. In 1950, we became a republic, a new India, as a multilingual India. And I must thank the census officers for counting the number of languages. In 1961, they gave a list of 1,652 mother tongues. That was India. For the last few decades, India is being made once again. And we come to some kind of climax at the moment there. I have given this broad brush picture of language diversity and making of India to show that there is no fixed idea of India in the past. It has kept changing. It has every time it has changed, language has had a very deep link with that change. The change has affected this future of languages. Languages have affected that change as well. So far, we have not written a history of our place. I am rather hesitant using the term nation or country because it immediately restricts the idea of India to a particular uh, temporal uh, zone. Uh, so, we so far not written a history of our place in terms of language or languages. We should do it someday because it's a serious matter. I shall now tell you why it is a serious matter. Of the nations in the world that have maximum number of languages, India is among the first four nations. 
Papua New Guinea, Nigeria, Indonesia, and India. These four have several hundred languages. I always used to think as to why it is these four that have several hundred languages and others don't have so many. And the simplest where there was historically no food shortage. These are the, I mean, get into, please think of it anthropologically. These are the places which allowed maximum number of population knots to come into existence historically. I know that political interference has created artificial food shortage. I am aware of that. I am aware of the 19th century, what happens in the 19th century and 20th century. So, but I am thinking of long past, of about 60,000, 50,000 years, these four areas were surplus in food, plenty of animal life. I am not talking of vegetarian food, I am talking of real food. <laughs> I mean, of 70,000 years of human history, about 7,000 years is agriculture. 63,000 years is without agriculture. Therefore, I use the term real food. <laughs> because we had no food shortage, so many languages existed. Also, because so many languages existed, it was possible to tackle, tap, cope with every kind of ecological zone. Andaman was, you know, Jarwas of Andaman were mentioned by it. If you have a language to deal with your ecology zone, then you have the best returns from that zone without creating a food shortage for your people. Having many languages was the insurance for the continuity of life and civilization in India. One reason why Indian civilization did not break down in between and continued forever and ever and ever is this engagement of the local community with the local ecosystem. And for that engagement of the local people with local ecosystem, the local language was the necessity. India has this great language diversity traditionally. And I mentioned with pride, and with the many things to be proud about, the, uh, among the top very few uh, oldest surviving languages in the world, I mean if you are looking at the Guinness uh, Book of World Records, Tamil is one, etc, uh, etc. Et but I can mention many uh, uh, language which created maximum number of poetic meters. India has that language. But I am not going I am not going to the Guinness book. I am thinking of something different. This language diversity has come under threat. The language diversity which made us who we are has come under threat in the last 50 years. And the threat has intensified, increased in the last 30 years and has come to almost a climax in the last few years. Very quickly I'll go over it and then, then I'll explain what that threat is and why it is there. I said that 16, uh, 1652 mother tongues were listed in the 61 census but in 1971 census this number was brought down to 109. 1550 kind of languages were wiped out, mother tongues were wiped out of the census. The reason was that, you know, this language data comes out normally six or seven years after the census takes place. And in the 70s, early 70s, Bangladesh became a separate nation, independent nation on the question of language. And so our government felt that showing, showcasing too much of language diversity would be disastrous for unity of the country. Because in those days, unity was a great theme, just as it has now resurfaced. So, uh, the names were wiped out. Of course, they were reinstated subsequently. But very sadly, I have to say, 
I mean, I have to say uh, two things rather sadly. I am going to be sad twice. <laughs> uh, the first time I am sad uh, saying that the 20, uh, 2021 census has just not taken place. We don't know if, if we exist in the country or not. We don't know how many people there are, uh, what they, uh, uh, what is their hemoglobin level, what number of schools and all that. Uh, so one is sad because if there is no data, then there is no existence. Uh, the uh, second thing I am sad about is that in 19, uh, 2011 census, 2011 census, which is available last census, the number of mother tongues listed in the census was 1,369. That is, as against 1,652 mother tongues 50 years ago, now we are 1,369 mother tongues. That's, that's very clearly simple arithmetic. 280 mother tongues have literally died, actually died. In 71, it was concealment of data. This time, it's actual data. I mean, and it shows that 280 mother tongues have died. And that's a very big number of dying languages for us in a period of 50 years. If I were to compare the rate of death of languages in Papua New Guinea, in Indonesia, in uh, Nigeria, uh, I find that we are not lagging behind any of those countries. We are a little ahead of them. And if we continue it this way, we might be left with not 1360 mother tongues 10 years from now, but maybe 500 mother tongues. I'm not trying to terrify you. This is what is happening to like, whose mother tongues are going. The denotified and nomadic tribes. The people who were wrongly branded as criminal tribes during the colonial times and who chilled and who never got any justice. They had to spend several generations in soft prisons. And who children you see sailing balloons at every crossroads in Delhi. Or those little things at the crossings, their languages because they are suspected forever as criminals and they are, they are uh, mob lynch, they are hounded out of cities and villages, they feel shy of speaking their languages and their languages are gone or going. These are at least 190 such communities in India denotified and nomadic communities in India whose languages are almost sunk, almost gone. Each of their languages has words with different kind of knowledge related to birds and animals. The Hakki Pikis of Karnataka, the bird catchers, they know so much about birds that they would be knowing that bats bring your virus. <laughs> Go and find out how many Pardis died during Corona and you will find that the number is surprisingly less. The languages of the coastal communities have disappeared. I'm not saying they are disappearing because the entire coastal area is given to uh, corporates. And therefore, the fishing people have no livelihood. They have moved inland, deserting their languages. I used to know a language called Kharwa in Gujarat. About five lakh of young people used to get together every year for one week to decide how to get married. Girls and boys had to stay together for eight days and choose their life partners. They no longer get together. They are nowhere to be seen there. I mean, I am mentioning this gathering of 30 years ago. It is gone. The Kharwa language has disappeared. I can go on mentioning names of the languages. that are. The coastal people of this country have lost their languages. The denotified and nomadic tribes are losing their languages. And many of the Adivasis are losing their languages. Who are these people? These are the smallest margins of our society. You remember this anti-CA agitation? 
it was because the law said that uh, that uh, jains buddhists christians uh, hindus parsis etc etc will uh, get citizenship if they if they are forced due to persecution from bangladesh afghanistan or pakistan uh, that did not mention the names of 12 tribal communities in bangladesh who are traditionally migrant communities moving between you know from one side of brahmaputra to other side of brahmaputra 12 tribal communities who are the smallest persecuted religious groups because they are independent religions as listed in the census of bangladesh and as listed in the census of india they were not so there was there any agitation for them in this country no these small minorities are losing languages the diversity will shrink because of this but these are only some known facts you know something which we know rather easily that i mentioned there is something not known to us that i want to mention uh but i'll take about 5 minutes with your permission i wanted to say that neurologists have studied the human brain to find that there is a great fatigue in the brain in broca's law side of the brain that is people will no longer read in future children do not read you know as the professors know their students no longer read even professors who used to read books no longer read books same thing it's a fact is is not their fault it's something has happened to the brain in the process of the evolution and it will continue humans are rapidly trying to enter a virtual world the cyberspace they want to cease to be physical and be only digital that's the craving everywhere and in the digital world in the cyberspace there is no room for human languages natural languages in that world the digits replace words the past tense the present and the future collapse together our idea of time and space have no meaning in that world that world has no space for languages meant for earth bound consciousness it has space only for interplanetary kind of movement and colonization and communication and therefore it is a sure future of human languages that they will disappear and will enter a zone of silence it is in that transition from natural language and natural language diversity to shrinking of the diversity and disappearance of natural languages that dictatorships all over the world have emerged since my time is over i wanted to say maybe a one another sentence people uh, who have become reckless individualist consumers have also become a bit scared of everything and have gone into compulsively habitually gone into the insurance regime because they have no courage every coward wants to have an insurance it's a fact to the extent that americans now are insuring insurance <laughs> and and some of us who are more affluent here will be doing it soon if they are not already done it. such people like regimes that form regulations giving an illusory sense of you know illusory comfort of order and protection and these people then you know raise hands and allow the totalitarian regimes to come up all over the world 
the totalitarian regime, the shrinking of language, and the loss of courage, and our alienation from ecology, all are parts of the same parcel which we are handling as a ticking bomb. And it's not more than a couple of decades from now that we may be mentioning the word democracy as a historical term applied to a foolishly idealistic socialistic people. There is a way to fight that and that way is to work on language diversity. Because diversity defeats any totalitarian design. But my concern is not defeating you know this or that regime. I, 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 I really don't care. I'm being frank. My concern is far graver. And that concern is we in India were made several times over as a linguistic civilization and every time we turned you no know, we, we we turned skin we changed skin and became a new civilization linguistically that's the method that we invented this is the only civilization where word is worshipped if we do not care for our method of creating civilization. How shall we fight the onset of a new virtual world which is wiping out human civilization? Language diversity and making of India are subjects on which each one of us must think, speculate, getting out of our present frames more seriously and maybe someday some of you who are younger will find a solution as to how to keep our diversity and our language alive because we need our democracy and our sense of justice and equality to remain alive. Thank you so much. We do have a brief question and answer session, but we unfortunately don't have a cordless mic. So, just pass be sawal hai, they are requested to come in front and raise them, or they can even come up here, but be very loud. It's a small auditorium, so you will be audible, but we don't have a cordless mic. So. Yeah, um, please pause. Uh, I have failed in one of the duties I was assigned, uh, which I should have done in the beginning, um, is that, uh, you know, the Suril Memorial Trust is uh, uh, sustaining itself uh, with contributions from people like you and I, and, uh, you know, to, for us to continue to create platforms like this, where we have process of the eminence of Professor Devi and the like, to be uh, here to engage with us. We need the support of all those who value these kind of occasions. There is a, uh, a desk placed outside. Anyone who would like to contribute to the uh, trust, uh, welcome to make your contribution, the smallest to the uh, larger amounts. And the contributions are exempted from uh, you know tax. I mean, you have the benefit of uh, ATG, whatever. So all are uh, requested to, to make your minimum contributions to the trust so that the trust can continue to do the good work it has been doing um, so far. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony. Uh, we can take few questions. Uh, yes.
the the question of freedom in this new age, new era, coming era, is a complex question, and we cannot fight fight it just politically. Political fight is necessary, but there is a larger fight, civilizational fight, a cultural fight is necessary for freedom. Otherwise, we are already trapped. We are almost enslaved. There was this song at the beginning: "Kya hum gulam nahi banenge, azad rehenge." लेकिन हम गुलामी में इतने अंदर उतरे हैं कि हमारे में से बहुत लोगों को यह पता ही नहीं चलता कि हम गुलाम हैं और इसके लिए भाषा के भाषा के प्रश्न के तरफ संस्कृति के प्रश्न के तरफ साइंस क्या है इसके तरफ चित्त क्या है इसके कॉन्शियस इसके तरफ फिलोसफी ज्यादा ध्यान देना चाहिए दैट कुड बी वन काइंड ऑफ पॉलिटिक्स Just as politics could be one kind of cultural behavior or misbehavior. We can take maybe a couple of more questions. Yes, yes. So, आपका जवाब मुझे देना है मैं दे देता हूँ after this question. So languages are born, they grow, and they decline or die, right? When you made that point uh, that the birth of languages. is also in a way the making of india what was causing like for example when let's say the decline of sanskrit took place that shaddan bol of and others talk about was that a crisis what was causing this decline and then the birth of as you said but i'll answer the second question the de decline of any language is caused by lack of livelihood in that language as simple as that sanskrit was not able to provide livelihood to most people therefore most people decided they will go out of sanskrit and write in avadi tulsi ram or in marathi tukaram or so if sanskrit had provided livelihood to most people most people would have continued to use sanskrit at time at one time persian was widely used here because there was livelihood in persian available once that was over people have moved out of persian gone into english when english won't be able to give livelihood people will move out of english something something else but to your earlier question languages are born they grow and they die uh, but their birth growth and death is not like say the birth growth of a buffalo or fish or bird they are not organic systems they are not bio systems they are uh, only social systems and uh, their tokens their tokens uh, because our consciousness is engaged with language so much we often imagine languages having life languages have existence in time existence over time and they disappear when livelihood is not in view in that language people migrate from one language to another language as simple as that and therefore some languages stay on in one country but disappear in another country that can also yes um hello sir uh, my name is manendra i am uh, uh, i try to ask about uh, uh, like in the time of veda like you said that uh, sanskrit you consider sanskrit as um, a time where when uh, making of india was happening so uh, my question is like uh, untouchables and sudra were not allowed to uh, to speak or to uh, study sanskrit so can we consider uh, uh, this uh, phase as a making of india no uh, the, the varna system and the the creation of sudras as dr ambedkar has so capably explained in the annihilation of caste was a shameful thing for us was a shameful thing for us i am not endorsing that and i'll be the last one to endorse that but but it is a fact that the sanskrit language came here and it got hold of the state structure it entered the state structure and therefore captured what whatever we were at that time buddha and to some extent mahavi tried to oppose this also the the non believers 
try to question on this some of these saner voices who spoke sanskrit also question it from within sanskrit i am not i am not defending the varna system i am saying that sanskrit existed there and the dialogue between sanskrit and the prakru sanskrit and pali took place and that entire thing was what india was at that time it made india that way at that time that's uh, please don't you know when i say making of india i am not saying everything that we had in the past why did the past was always good that's not in during i spoke a bhakti period uh, it is not that everything in that period was good there i met somebody from rajasthan today working on the sati and if sati existed side by side with kabir and meera then it 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 cannot be defended i understand that but i am saying that at that time the earlier india change actually after the decline of the indus civilization the varna system got consolidated and developed by the end of that period long period into caste system and that that was derogatory for humans it was an insult to human spirit but the language is framing that it is sanskrit and pali and prakrit and sanskrit played a dominant role in framing that so we made india this was what some people think that india alone is true i don't think so get my point okay so just the last round 1 2 3 yeah we uh, yeah. uh, i'm from historical studies uh you elaborate elaborate on the the moments in which language was inadvertently employed to shape and reshape make make again in india so i i want to bring in solar if you permit the seven bolo ki mention so he by the early modern period there is a very much realization happening so he then goes on to say there is some cosmopolis and as a malayalam my first thing is malayalam and there is a second it's also personal question for all of this so uh, in that moment he do you think he emphasized it a little bit on extra on sanskrit that is that what pose because when i think about malayalam how it get distinguished from tamil because there is a brahmanical migration this hypothesis is going on okay. so yeah okay do you think how much that sanskrit would be like in a special way that we want to read would have been how much he is do you think it's a reason to be sure you can take to here yes at the back
uh, we should have actually got also linguistic districts and linguistic tarukas. Then the development of the people could have happened in terms of their knowledge of their ecology as it is in the other question. Of course, somebody will say, but then do you deny them the opportunity of learning English or no, I don't. Let them learn English. Let them have good mastery of the English language. Uh, but without forgetting, and this is for all of us, that the mightier a language becomes, the, uh, is, the most certain is the decline of that language. Latin and Sanskrit collapsed, but the Desi Bhasha survived, and the Roman languages, that is the, the Spanish, French, they emerged. Uh, this uh, a language has its carrying capacity and if it carries beyond its limits it starts crumbling fragmenting today the, the english spoken by new zealander is not understood by english spoken by the irish person english is breaking breaking up uh, and uh, my fear is if we force hindi to carry rather too much beyond its limit uh, it might face that that uh, debacle in future i don't want it to happen but so the, uh, so the, the what is natural for natural languages is to be locally connected with their ecologies and livelihood of the people it's a good development model it's a good cultural model, model, it's a good linguistic model, and it is sustainable. I think uh, we need to wind up this session before we move to the other formalities for the occasion. But I think Professor uh, Ganesh Devi's lecture compels us to think beyond the given. Uh, facts and values of life that we are taught on a daily basis. The question being that diversity is life and di linguistic diversity is cultural diversity, is a civilizational diversity and any attempt to uniformize it into one nation and one language is suicidal. So I think as a stakeholder in the future generation, as you young uh, students of this university have to be prepared to fight for diversity at every front of your life. Thank you so much, Professor Devi. Uh, we only have a little bit of formalities left to be completed. Uh, first, we will have uh, uh, Professor honored with the uh, souvenir to mark the occasion. I would request Malviga to do the honor. Uh, I would also request Malviga to do the honor of saying what of thanks. One of the main activities of the Sunil Memorial Trust is to hold an annual Sunil Memorial Lecture. In the past 10 years, many individuals have played a key role in helping us keep, keep up the lecture series without interruption. This year too, we received enormous support from all quarters. First of all, I would like to thank our speaker, Professor Ganesh M. Devi, for coming to JNU, all the way from coming, from, uh, coming to JNU, and he has come directly from the airport to deliver the 10th Sunil Memorial Lecture. Uh, our two mentors, Professor Satish Jain and Professor Arun Kumar, have been guiding the trust since its inception. It's been, it is indeed very remarkable that both of them have never missed a single meeting of the trust despite their academic engagements and health constraints. This year, we were fortunate to have Professor Asha Sarangi of the Center for Political Studies, JNU, as the chair and the key person behind 
the entire organization and coordination of the different aspects in the in an offline mode overcoming all obstacles with a very graceful approach the team of students from cps shubham ganesh abhijit and roshan provided the crucial support mechanism yes for asha ji to uh, so that we were able to hold the lecture in jnu a place which is very which was very close to sunil ji's heart we would especially like to thank harsh ji harsh kapoor for preparing the lovely posters not only for this year's lecture but consistently for all the past 10 years every year he patiently prepares many versions of the posters and the members of the trust have the luxury of choosing one out of them we are indeed blessed to have harsh ji's contribution year after year which continued even though his schedule became extremely tight as he took on the editorship of the mainstream weekly Uh, like last year noshad ji has joined hands to support the lecture by providing the much needed support of hosting meetings creating facilities for online viewing recording the lecture and all kinds of support needed at various junctures his pleasant demeanor makes all the tasks seem ex extremely easy to execute uh, we wish to thank pratidhwani for gracing the lecture with their presence this year too basan ji and uh, shubhendu ji have been instrumental in bringing them here today uh, we must thank all our young friends akshay dolly and particularly balu has been here to provide support uh, and anchored all the 10 lectures by welcoming the audience and helping to ensure that all activities are coordinated very well we thank all the members of the trust and all close friends and associates for helping the trust complete one decade most importantly we thank our audience for sparing the time to spend an evening and facilitate this offline lecture i'm emphasizing on offline because we are quite unhappy with the online lecture because this gives an opportunity for all of us to meet uh, once a year you know and people have been very close to sunil and they are working on the field and in various activities so this is a very very special location for the trust uh, and finally it is through this and other activities that the trust hopes to keep the memory of sunil alive and keep the discourse on the themes that were very important to him also the trust runs on donations so like uh, antony antony ji just said that kindly donate to the trust so that we can keep our activities going without any kind of sponsorship or any kind of you know help from corporations thank you